So it's going. Okay, well, welcome to uh, Mother's Day Sunday four. Um, yeah, a little, little background before I get going. Um, you know, before uh, Kathy and I moved over to uh, Gig Harbor, we were really actively involved in, uh, which is now Intermountain, uh, our Northwest Intermountain Senate. So I was the VP there for 10 years and on the, the Senate Council for at least four before I got to be the VP. But uh, so I was really engaged in understanding the three expressions of the Luther Church, uh, congregations, uh, the Senate and churchwide. And so when I got over here, it's like, well, I need to get uh, connected with the Southwestern um, Washington Senate. And uh, so I tried several times because I went onto the web page, I clicked on, put me on as a member so I get your emails whenever you send them out, and it never worked. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, so anyway, I um, tried a few times, then I eventually gave up last year and called Allison Keys at the office. And I said, Allison, do you know that that feature does not work? And uh, she signed me up. And so I started getting emails last summer, um, really to see again what's going on in the Senate. And uh, lo and behold, this popped up as uh, opportunity for congregations, engaging younger generations uh, was being advertised. And so uh, I, I thought, what a great opportunity because um, as we all know, when we go to church, there's really not a lot of youth in the church anymore. And uh, it's kind of raises the question, you know, what are churches doing right and what are we doing wrong? Um, because where have all the youth gone? Uh, and so I advertised it uh, to the congregation and uh, uh, that the very states that it was going to occur and then uh, got people signed up and we uh, got involved in the presentation from this book, Growing Young. Uh, and uh, I guess the rest is history. I get, I uh, drew the short straw, I guess, from all the people from Long State to present this. So, so anyway, a little more background. Um, so this, this project was really part of the uh, LIVE uh, project. And the LIVE project is a uh, ministry of the Northwest Washington Synod. So it was advertised there. Uh, what, what is LIVE? Uh, so LIV is, uh, it stands for Living into Vocational Engagement. And uh, so their, their goal is what they're trying to accomplish is, it's a network of lay uh, learning community discerning God's call, uh, theologically thoughtful, culturally responsive and communally engaged. Um, they wanna connect churches and forming Christian pro uh, public leaders. Uh, they're, um, method of teaching is flexible, a hybrid model of learning by Zoom or face-to-face. -face. And so we were still kind of last fall in throes of COVID. So uh, basically all our presentations were done uh, by Zoom. Uh, and the webinars were offered on September 26th, October 3rd, 17th, 24th, and uh, November 5th. Um, and just to give you a little background, uh, how they um, broke down the webinars in this book, you'll see so, uh, shortly that they discovered congregations that are successful in engaging young uh, youth uh, or in adults, um, they discovered their six core commitments uh, on how that happens. So basically we uh, reviewed in each one of those sessions, uh, two of the commitments. And then the last day on November 5th, we had to uh, come up with a project so we, we did come up with a project uh, that uh, we basically uh, decided we would go and meet with uh, the middle school and senior high youth uh, and engage them in some of the discoveries. And our whole project was really asking them questions uh, to discover what's going on in their life because um, most of the people in here are pretty gray haired. Our kids are in their 42, 40 and 38 cycles. And so it's been a while since we've engaged in the teenagers. Um, so, so anyway, um, that's a little more background. Some more background, the uh, presenters 
uh, where Becky Cole, she was, was director of the uh, children's ministry at Holy Spirit Lutheran Church in Kirkland. Deacon Inger Lori uh, Vischer, who's the director of children and youth and family faith, uh, faith formation at St. Mark's by the Narrows in Tacoma. And then Pastor Chelsea Globe, who's the pastor of Lutheran Campus Ministry at the University of Washington. Uh, the, the, the people here uh, at August Day who participated, it was uh, Kathy and myself, uh, Marlene Bridgeforth, uh, Debbie Waite, Gwyn Dogs, and Linda Ryberry. Um, so uh, again, this uh, whole presentation was uh, based on this growing uh, young, engaging younger generations webinar and what uh, the Fuller Youth Institute uh, on Growing Young uh, discovered. And uh, this book was authored, again, the Fuller Youth Institute has an army of people that did research to you know, find and discover, discover a lot of this, but um, it was Kara Powell, Jake Mulder, and Brad Griffin that uh, basically wrote this book after all their research. Um, so growing uh, young research. Um, so the first stage was um, the, U the Fuller Youth Institute reviewed over 80 books and articles containing academic research and popular writings about uh, both young people and church health. Uh, and then they conducted online surveys um, about church demographics and ministry qualities. Um, and they were completed by senior leaders and young youth adult directors in 259 of the 363 congregations that were asked to participate. So it started off as a really big uh, survey. So that was stage one. Stage two, uh, they worked with uh, the surveys completed and they uh, identified 41 of the most noteworthy churches were selected to conduct further research. Uh, so they, they conducted telephone interviews uh, on a total of 535 young people, parents, church staff, and volunteers across these congregations, uh, yielding nearly 10,000 pages of transcript. And then uh, stage three, um, they had teams of two or three researchers who were sent out to 12 of the 41 congregations to experience both their congregation worship services and age-specific ministries, as well as conduct in-person interviews and focus groups with young people, parents, volunteers, congregational members, and leadership staff. And uh, kind of a note here, the age group that they were focusing on were 15 to 29-year-olds. Bill. Um, the people who were involved were all Lutheran, but were all the congregations Lutheran? Yeah, no, um, there, there is a, uh, I hit the mouse here. <laughs> um, there, is, there is a good page in here that I marked uh, and to give you an idea of the churches that were studied. No de denomination affiliate of that origin original 259, 17% of them had no denomination affiliation at all. Um, 13 or 12% were Presbyterian. Uh, Twelve percent were Baptist, ten percent were United Methodist, Evangelical Covenant seven percent, uh, Roman Catholic six, uh, Reformation or Christian Reform four, Nazarene was four percent, uh, Anglican Episcopal four percent, Assemblies of God uh, four percent, uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance four percent, Lutheran Church Missouri Senate three percent, uh, ELCA was three percent. Uh, Church of uh, Christ Disciples, 3%, uh, and then the rest were kind of 2%. So that, that's kind of that initial group. Now, I don't recall a statistic of who were the last 41 that they zeroed down. I don't remember that uh, in reading the book. But uh, anyway, the age group is kind of interesting uh, because when uh, Laura Inger and uh, Becky and Chelsea presented, uh, they actually go, well, we think it can go up to 35. <laughs> that uh, in what they're seeing going on with young adults today. So, so anyway, that, that uh, was kind of the research process. So um, what, what did they uh, discover? And, and uh, I'm starting off with <clears throat> basically, what does a congregation 
uh, doesn't have to do. Uh, this is what they discover that they don't have to do um, to grow young. So the first one is a they discovered a price size, the precise size, uh, size doesn't matter. Um, the second one, a trendy location or region. Location doesn't uh, need to be a limitation in growing young. A third thing, an exact age of the congregation. God is working through uh, new and older congregations. A popular denomination or lack of denomination. Uh, God's work is, uh, is working through uh, churches of all stripes. An off the chart cool quotient. Uh, relational warmth is the new cool. A big modern building, uh, feeling at home transcends any building. A big budget, uh, financial investment is important, uh, but so is creativity supporting the youth uh, with whatever the budget allows. And, uh, you know, with our joint uh, ecumenical ministry right now, you know, each congregation is chipping in with whatever their budget allows. And then uh, a contemporary worship service. Uh, all varieties of worship are attracting youth. Uh, number nine, a watered down teaching style. Uh, talking about Jesus's ministry honestly is important for the youth. Uh, 10, a hyper entertaining ministry program. Uh, we don't need to compete with the endless entertainment options available to, be, to uh, today's youth. It's just impossible uh, with everything. So uh, what else did they discover? There's no magic model you can pr to uh, prescribe to, to make this happen. And growing young isn't about changing youth ministry, it's about changing church culture. So that's the big thing. Uh, growing young takes everyone. They really emphasize that, that, you know, again, we may be an older congregation, but, you know, after we went through this and uh, kind of noticed that, well, where are the, uh, youth in this group, 15 to 29. Uh, that's why I think a lot of us agreed to volunteer with Jess and uh, go on and discover what's going on with the youth. Uh, the, the big thing is they did, uh, though, discover there were six commitments in order to make congregations grow young. And so that's what I'm going to go through here in the next uh, slides. And uh, I'll go through each um, commitment and I'll pause uh, after each commitment to see if you have any questions about each commitment. But uh, uh, so the, the six core commitments that they uh, discovered were the following. So uh, the first one up here is keychain leadership. The next one, em empathy today, Jesus's message, warm relationships, prior prioritize everywhere and best neighbors. And uh, we'll talk about this little thing here later. Uh, but uh, they, these were the six core commitments. Um, and uh, one of the questions you probably have immediately is, well, you have to do these in order. And the answer is no. Uh, you can do them in any order you want, but uh, there is uh, some important aspects of these. So the, the first one is uh, the leaders. Uh, there's four type of key, um, of key leadership. Uh, the, the first one, there's keyless leaders, there's key hoarding leaders, there's key loaning leaders, and then there's key chain leaders. So uh, keyless leaders are often young and inexperienced without much authority or access. Uh, they spend their time uh, proving they're worthy to uh, possess the keys at all. Uh, key hoarding leaders, uh, always uh, holding the keys and refusing to give others access. They run the show. Uh, key loaning leaders often take the keys off the keychain and let others borrow them temporarily. They make sure they get the keys back quickly when it's done. And then uh, key chain leaders, um, they're very aware of the keys they hold. They're constantly opening, opening doors for some while training and entrusting others who are uh, ready for their own set of keys. Instead of centralizing authority, they empower other, especially young people, and then they spread leadership out amongst the whole congregation. So what are some of the uh, characteristics of these keychain leaders? Uh, the first one, they're mature, uh, not always young. So they're, you know, all of all ages. 
uh, are real, not relevant. Uh, th this kind of in the book they're talking about, uh, you don't have to wear skinny jeans. You don't have to dye your hair purple. You don't have to get tattoos. You know, you just have to be yourself, be your real self. Um, you're warm, not distance, uh, distance. Uh, know what matters to people, not just uh, other pastors. So again, this book was somewhat focused on pastors and how they need to lead their, their church. So it's, it really, it, it matters to all people. It's not just to pastors. And then trust and empower others. Uh, they don't try to be a super leader. Uh, and they take the long view, not the short uh, sighted, uh, sighted steps. So, so anyway, um, that's the keychain leaders. I don't know if there's anything that st stuck out or, again, I know there's some, um, several people here who, who attended with me on these webinars, but I think the keychain leadership is pretty straightforward. Uh, so the next characteristic was empathy today. It says, instead of judging or criticizing, step into the shoes of this generation. Be curious and open to listening to you. And uh, probably a little background, and again, I know you have the handouts, but uh, this 15 to 29 year old group right now, it's almost all Generation Z, uh, which they were born on that handout in 1996. So uh, right now they're basically 26, 27. Uh, so they're almost to the top there. But it is some of the uh, millennials, too, that are crossing over into this range. Um, so what are the characteristics of empathy today? Uh, churches go, grow young by empathizing or feeling with this generation of young people. Uh, young people wrestle with three ultimate questions. Who am I? A question of identity. Where do I fit? a question of belonging, and what difference uh, do I make, a question of purpose. And so um, these questions are not unique to young people, teenagers and emerging adults, um, but they are generally felt, uh, uh, feel them more intensely than the older generations. Because I, again, I think we all have those questions, but youth tend to have them more uh, intensely. Adolescence has been extended and younger people are in a longer season of exploration. So they talk here, 25 feels like the new 15. 15 seems to be, uh, seems like the new 25. An earlier start, starting line and a later finish. So this, this is really obvious now too. I, I got a uh, additional article here. If, if you can see this, it's basically showing uh, people or uh, birds uh, are they going to fly out of the nest? And uh, that's kind of a depiction of the youth because this article talks about, uh, I believe 54% of the uh, adolescent generation are living at home right now. It's the biggest number since the depression. And the depression, it was 48% uh, of the youth were living at home. So, uh, and uh, re reading this article, it's interesting uh, interviewing some of the uh, or some of the comments that the researchers have in here that uh, youth uh, are really comfortable living at home because their uh, standard of living is better uh, at their parents' house because they know they can't get an apartment or whatever better. Uh, they're not ready for adulting, it's called, uh, growing up and leaving the nest. Um, and uh, a lot of them simply don't have the uh, resources to buy the nest. Uh, so, um, so anyway, um, uh, and again, some of that statistics uh, are on the uh, handouts and we can talk about that a little bit later too. But, but again, uh, they, they talk about, uh, you know, 15 is like the new 25. On the flip side, this Generation Z is much more te technologically savvy because they've never grown up without technology. And uh, they're much more educated than we were. And so that's, that's the end of the spectrum where they're probably much more uh, savvy and educated than we were at 15. But uh, on the other end, they're not ready to fly the nest. Uh, the next one, uh, young people search for identity um, 
uh, is made erratic by their uh, pervasive stress and their peripheral fate. Uh, and uh, I know Kathy and I definitely see this when we go to youth group that uh, when Jess is talking with the youth, they're under a lot of uh, pressure in the schools. And uh, we had one youth that said they were even nervous to go to the Tacoma Mall um, because of what could happen there and, and what's going on in society, you know, is dangerous to be anywhere nowadays. And even, you know, with all the school shootings. Uh, Teenagers and emerging adults' uh, quest for belonging is thwarted by the omnipresence of technology, uh, sexual experimentation, and adult abandonment. So that's that's kind of the key points that uh, the book uh, emphasized on empathy today. But any thoughts uh, resonate? Yeah. Question, Gary. yeah. Uh, talk about peripheral faith. What do you really? Yeah. So peripheral faith. Uh, again, if you uh, look at the handouts, uh, the handouts actually came from the Senate Assembly, uh, where uh, Becky uh, Inger Lori uh, in uh, Chelsea presented, uh, and I didn't know what they were going to present after they presented this for five weeks or five different sessions. And uh, if you look on some of those statistics, um, a lot of the youth are very spiritual. Uh, there, there's a, a graph on there that shows the spirituality. Um, but uh, again, as far as attending uh, worship regularly, uh, it's, it's very much like none to one uh, uh, Sunday a year. So it's very much on the periphery uh, because that, there's a circle on there. And I do have that um, handout up here that we could talk about. But uh, the youth um, just are really on the periphery of religion. And uh, and again, even these kids that we meet with Jess, um, they're church kids and uh, their religion is very, very shallow, some of them, uh, from what, what we've experienced so far, yeah. Did you say something about adult abandonment? Is that from the youth's point of view? Uh, or is that statistics that say that uh, are less likely to engage you today than before. Yeah, I'm trying to recall the reading of the book uh, because I read it last fall. Um, yeah, I think it's more, uh, you know, again, some kids are definitely abandoned by their, their parents, and so they're living in, in a tough environment. But uh, uh, again, I, I, I don't know I don't recall. Do you do you recall anything, Kathy? Is that, is that connect somehow to the fact that it's native to us to want them to come to us and then our way of doing they do they, they are so tech savvy, but they're living in a very different world. And so not uh, not a lot of understanding of adults who come. Okay. So yeah, somewhat uh, Adults not understanding where they are, so that could be a sense of abandonment. Yeah. Okay, so I, I relate to that because we have uh, college age grandchildren, uh -huh. and uh, one of them is a senior here at Big Harbor, and he's been quite ambivalent about whether to go to college, go to college, and to the point where we knew that there was friction in the family, and they were, his parents said, "Don't bring up." The <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but uh, but I found it more difficult personally to know where do I engage him, other than uh, you know just sort of well how are things going and the usual mm -hmm. answer fine. <laughs> uh, what are you taking in school? Uh, they list their classes, but no, uh, yeah. no uh, addition of anything there. And uh, but I guess one of the things. We're gathering together, and uh, Teddy asked, uh, "Are the boys coming too?" And uh, their mother we emailed back, "I'm their mother. They are coming." <laughs> <laughs> so I think that sometimes, as adults, we have to be a little heavy-handed, and a little yeah. what we perceive as being pushy. That we really do want to know what their world is and who they are. 
Yeah, I, I know that can be tough. Uh, Kathy and I took our kids to church and youth groups and confirmation and everything else. And I, I think it's not as if they don't believe in God. It's just, um, I think the church did something to them. They, they were growing up in the, uh, the age of LGBTQ was just starting to come out. And uh, their friends were part of that. And the church was not supporting that. And, and they did. And uh, so, um, you know, that, that started to turn them away from some of the church beliefs at that time. Uh, but uh, yeah, now Kathy and I thought it would be easier once we came to Gig Harbor for them to worship with us on Easter. And now it's the opposite because they can just drive to us after church instead of <laughs> going all the way to Eastern Washington. <laughs> Yeah, and, for church. yeah, so. they have to come with us. <laughs> yeah, so. so can we, maybe the phrase adult abandonment, maybe it's more adult disconnection from their world. Yeah. So I know technologically, my son in law is just incredibly savvy, mm -hmm. and I have no idea what he's <laughs> talking about most of the time. Yeah. I feel disconnected. I didn't. I don't abandon him, but right. I'm not part of his world. Yeah, I think I think it's more along those lines. Yeah. Okay. Good comments. Oh, and there was, I guess, one last one. Uh, that this generation hungers for purpose uh, remains unsatisfied because of their jaded realism and culture of pluralism. Uh, and uh, again, we know that. Goodness sakes, our society is really divided right now, uh, and the, and you, you can see once we get to that handout um, what their key issues are right now. Um, in a lot of society, there aren't very key issues. So, yeah, regarding cultural pluralism, does this book look at that? Because I was just talking to a man last week. They intentionally have a three-generational household, uh -huh. and are we seeing more of that? Broader base of cultures. Yeah, yeah, I think that's someone uh, dressed in this. You know, multiple generations are now living under the same roof. It's, you know, some in some cases it's uh, grandparents, parents, and, and the kids. You know, they're all living under one roof. Yeah. And goodness, who knows how many different uh, viewpoints those three generations have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, uh, the next discovery was uh, Jesus's message. Um, taking Jesus's message seriously means churches uh, pay attention to the life and words of Christ. Young people uh, can then articulate a gospel that is less talk about beliefs and more talk about Jesus, uh, less tied to formulas and more focused on redemptive narrative and less about heaven later and more about life here and now. So I, I think that's a great comment, but I think it could pertain to all of us. You know, um, I think one of us, uh, one of the fall downs of, I don't know, uh, mainline denominations is we, we keep our message hidden under a bushel basket. Uh, we can't talk about it very well. Yeah. Young people want to know not only what they're saved from, but also what they're saved for. Uh, they don't want to take action, uh, or they want to take action, not just hear about what they can't do. Uh, participate, uh, participation and challenges are two uh, central features of churches growing young. So uh, again, uh, if we have youth here, let's get them involved, is kind of the message there. Uh, evangelism isn't dead among young people, but it looks different than in the past uh, century. Uh, vital factors to help young people uh, share faith today include building authentic relationships, listening well, and being honest and uh, about questioning and doubts. So, you know, so Keith, you mentioned, you know, you're, you're struggling with your, your grandson. It's like, all you can do is listen and uh, hope something clicks eventually. Uh, it's kind of what the, and, and build, continue to have that relationship with them. So any thoughts on Jesus' message? Uh, again, I, I, I think it speaks to all of us. It's not just the younger generation. 
Yeah, about a man who's a great Hindu in India, and he actually attends a uh, Christian church Bible study because of Jesus' message. Mm -hmm. And that really is what fascinates him and drives him to you know, go back around uh, Christian faith as an Hindu, but finds it important to be a part of these discussions. Yeah, yeah Phyllis. Uh, it's important to differentiate what we think. Yeah, and that culture of pluralism we talk about. It's like the messages are totally opposite uh, in some cases. Uh, Phil. The uh, statistics here about you know only 35% of the population goes to church it is really what it's saying is Christendom is over. And and the bad news is Christendom is over. The good news is we get to define what Christendom is for us. What Phyllis was just saying, and and making making it in a sense more uh, uh, palatable to another generation. Mm -hmm. Gabby, you said that just before you answered it, one of the things that I read in the last year that has just stuck with me so much is Diana Butler Bass saying that historically Christians have started with belief. Oh, you want to be a Christian? You must believe this. You must believe. Other thoughts? Okay. So the uh, next characteristic, uh, they, they focused on warm relationships. Uh, churches that grow young sometimes actually program less in order to free up more space for re relational connection. So, you know, the, the idea is not to have programs that everybody's running in a hundred different directions. They actually free up time. Uh, warm is the new cool. More than flashy worship, young people want authenticity and connection. When they talk about their churches, they talk about people and warmth. The most common uh, phrase people used to describe their churches was, was like family. Other words describing warmth included welcoming, accepting, belonging, authentic, hospitable, open, learning, and caring without judgment. So, um, honest relationships and ability to be real and authentic, uh, again. And then um, the last one was intergenerational relationships through mentoring and uh, corporate worship, uh, create connections across generations. And again, um, you know, what I'm seeing uh, in the Lutheran Church and other mainline churches. Uh, we're part of that intergenerational relationship. Uh, going to youth group, as Pastor made in the uh, announcements today, that's our chance to get to know these 15 um, uh, middle school and at least high school. You know, we haven't engaged with college students, but uh, at least you can hear what's going on with them and be a mentor. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, 
I think we heard that, uh, or sometimes, or somewhere else in this presentation, it talks about the parents are the main mentors, but we certainly can help. Um, but anything about warm relationships that uh, Pastor said. My experience with this congregation is this is our wheelhouse. Yeah. We do this better than most congregations I know, Lutheran or otherwise. Um, people can't come in the door here without being welcomed, and that's great. Um, but I heard you say earlier, like it takes all of us. Mm -hmm. It's very tempting to sort of sit back and say, well, we'll let somebody else do that. We'll let somebody else volunteer with Sunday school to youth group. Let somebody else welcome the folks. You don't have to be all in. Like, if you could, there is a point at which you like turn people off. Everybody clumps on you at once when you walk in the door, right? But people feel that when they come in this building. And maybe the next logical step is to sort of export that to other places too, to show up, you know, where they're at at the youth group or whatever. Um, and to, to just be intentional about building those connections, even if it's just being intentional about saying, hey, how are you doing this week? Yeah. This is this is something we're really good at. Yeah. I think one of the things, you know, authenticity and all of that sometimes that feels a little like like how do I do that? And I think one of the the key pieces in, in building relationships with young people is that being able to communicate genuinely very openly. You're not asking them questions about their life because you want them to give you some right answer that you are looking for. They're very attuned to that. You're asking because you're genuinely curious and you want to know what is really yeah, it, it's a challenge. I know just uh, when we talk to our grandkids that uh, are involved in a hundred different things, you know, so how is school fine? Uh, so you you got to keep digging because um, they, they don't just freely give you information. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a part of being authentic. You know, we we all have our ups and downs, and it's good for them to see that. Yeah, Eunice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You probably answered this question already, but I'm wondering when were these surveys done? Was it post pandemic or pre pandemic? This was pre pandemic. The, the book was published in 2016. So, you know, another one of those. You know, has it changed since the pandemic? But um, I can tell you uh, at the end, um, I list uh, resources and the link to uh, the Fuller Institute. Um, but their research um, seems to continue to go on because they have companion books that for parents for this and, and other leaders. So uh, I haven't really explored if they're more recent publications or not, but it definitely was pre pandemic. So it may behoove us that both as individuals, couples, families, 
and as a church to really think about this and how does this work post pandemic? Mm -hmm. We might have gotten out of the habit of being hospitable. Yeah. 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 Other thoughts? Okay. So the, the next one is uh, prioritize youth and people and families everywhere. Uh, was, was the, uh, uh, I think this is number five. So uh, comments, some of the key characteristics, uh, churches that grow young are willing to make young people a priority, not just in rhetoric, but also in reality. This does not happen automatically. They emphasize youth in their overall philosophy worship gatherings, staffing, and budget. Um, you know, again, um, we have, um, you know, prioritized uh, supporting Jess, Jess and the youth program, it's definitely in our budget. Um, uh, the, the participants in this uh, uh, webinar, you could actually, when we were done, go in and take a survey. Um, uh, and uh, the survey was great, but when we were all done taking it, our weakness was we didn't have any youth in this group to engage with. That, that came out loud and clear in the survey. But uh, what they're really talking about is if we have youth in this group, get them, get them involved in church, let them read the lessons and um, be a usher or an acolyte or whatever, or let them lead a youth uh, group of some sort but uh, pay attention to it. Uh, so I, I think that's important uh, because uh, uh, I, I think where August Day is right now, we're gonna build our youth from the bottom up right now because we have a lot of younger uh, fam uh, kids, not only in our uh, church, but also in uh, little lambs that uh, are involved in the church. And, and uh, so they're not the 15 to 29 year olds, but we got to remember to keep them engaged uh, as we go along. So. I'm not sure how many people know this, but this Sunday morning book club that we have started, Stephanie was there the last Sunday, the, the last Sunday and the Sunday before that, we have 31 people there. Not all children, but 31 people. This is, this is something that is happening here right now that will help engage that generation at any point in the world, any teenagers someday, you know, who can learn that this is family at home. So what that means is you go to keep the message first. <laughs> <laughs> what that means is, if we're going to prioritize that here, somebody, could be anybody, could help ensure that that continues to happen. And lots of somebody's could show up and get to know the people who come to that. Yeah, I was going to say, so we won't be the end of our family book club until the first day of class. No. But everybody's Sunday schedule, you never know who you're going to see on a Sunday. You know, they all get 8 30, and they get 11. And, you know, we are less of a pattern. You know, we don't do homework and dinner on those Sundays. Uh, so we're real excited for going to keep gathering as families on the first Sunday of the month. But in the summer, we're just going to come play on the playground. So come on out. Get to know <laughs> So the, the next point, uh, prioritizing uh, young people means prioritizing families. 
Parents are the uh, strongest spiritual influences in their kids' lives, but they need uh, our support and the partnership of the church. Uh, so I kind of mentioned that earlier. Young people need load-bearing roles in the community, meaning they uh, contribute through serving and using their time. So again, I know Jess is uh, doing that. She's going to have them make cards tomorrow. Um, she's had them at the Fish Food Bank. Uh, they're going to do a summer uh, trip to uh, Ocean Shores, I believe, or somewhere out there on the coast, and they basically have a project all week you know, or projects that they're going to do. So again, uh, building those relationships in community with each other uh, and, and the chaperones that are going to go on that trip are important. And uh, good leaders and programs don't automatically lead to prioritization nor are good intentions enough. Prioritizing young people everywhere often requires a congregational shift. So again, um, sometimes I, I think uh, I've heard it uh, mentioned in council, you know, adult form, it's like sometimes we're preach, preaching to the choir because the same people always come. So uh, we need to make sure this gets to everyone, uh, including the people that walk out the door on Sunday because they need to hear that it's changing culture, church culture and it includes them too, not just us. So, but, uh, so that's number five. Number uh, six, the last one is being the best neighbor. So uh, churches that grow young strive to be the best neighbors both locally and globally. They recognize the careful dance that uh, values both fidelity to the scriptures commands for holiness and knowing and graciously loving our neighbors. So again, um, that message of love our neighbors as ourself comes through this. Uh, younger generations are not looking for what congregations are against, but what they are for. Uh, offering teenagers and emerging adults a thoughtful path to neighbor is not easy. 36% uh, of the churches in the study named challenging uh, challenges navigating culture as one of their biggest barriers uh, in ministry to young people. So um, again, it's it's not easy as they discover. And then uh, best or being best neighbor means practicing mercy towards people outside our walls by adhering to Jesus's great commandment. Uh, again, love our neighbors as ourselves. And again. Uh, when Kathy and I joined this church, uh, one of the, the reasons was it's like this congregation gets outreach. You know, we're we're doing a lot for this community, but uh, you know, I think sometimes the next step is making our face present in all these things we do, uh, because that's how we're going to even get recognized better. And then uh, churches that grow young uh, neighbor well by honoring what's good, making their world better and respecting the journey as much as the destination. Uh, these congregations show a, neighbor uh, show a neighbor love that is greater than differences in ethnicity and social economic status. So again, whoever your neighbor is, love them, care for them, honor what, what's going on. Okay, so that's best neighbor. Um, so this is kind of the six core commitments uh, again, but one thing they wanted to point out on this, and again, you can attack these from any angle, um, but uh, the Florida Youth Institute's uh, research has convinced them that there's a hinge point uh, in this whole uh, um, core commitment process. Separating churches that grow old uh, from those that are growing young uh, is a priority. So you remember that little um, thing here, growing old, this is the priority everywhere. What they discovered is uh, Florida Youth Institute calls this uh, section here a hinge point because while churches who have keychain leaders empathize with youth, uh, or young people focus on Jesus and nurture warmth can be lovely churches. They can eventually get comfortable, face inward, and ultimately grow old. 
If they fail to prioritize young people everywhere and help them live it as good neighbors in the world over time, the congregation will age out. So again, priority, uh, pri prioritize everywhere. Um, we all need to get behind whatever effort it is uh, that's going on. So that, those are the six uh, commitments. Uh, we kind of asked questions along the way, but um, one, of, one of the things on the handouts here, you know, some of this summarizes some of the points made, but uh, I think that first section up there, um, it's, it's kind of important because people get frustrated on the old way of ministry that people are just gonna come knocking down our uh, doors and come to church, but, uh, I like this statement here from Max Dupree. The first job of leaders is to define reality. So some of these points are what's going on in the church today. Uh, in 2020, 47% of the U.S. adults belong to a church, synagogue, and a mosque. This is down almost 20 points from 1999. So it's uh, the first time it's fallen under 50% of people belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. Uh, change is primarily due to the rise in Americans with no religious preference. Over the past two decades, the percent of Americans who do not identify with any religion, nuns, has grown from 8% in 1998 to 2000 to 13% in 08 to 10 and 21% now. Um, and then in the Pacific Northwest, we have our own identity here uh, because 35% of the population uh, or 33% identify as nuns. Those who participate in religious community uh, constitute only 35% of the population. So 65% does not participate in religion. It's the highest percentage in the nation. And uh, the other thing, uh, you know, some people get exposed to uh, other churches and think they're growing, but there's no Christian tradition that's growing in the U.S. today. So, uh, and, and I, put in red there, you know, some, where some of this came from, because I think at the same time, um, Sam Torben, uh, he was in, uh, I think, an interim role at the Episcopal Church, Christ Episcopal, and uh, he was giving a webinar to his church members as they were in the interim process and trying to call a new priest. Uh, and so he did a whole presentation on what's going on in religion today to get them up to speed. And uh, yeah, and so this is just kind of a summary. And then this, this was the handout uh, that had some interesting statistics about uh, Generation Z. Again, they're born after 1996. They're true digital natives, most are, uh, the most racially and ethnically diverse generation ever, uh, more likely to pursue higher education, um, more likely to hold progressive liberal viewpoints on social and political issues, care deeply about climate change, more likely to uh, use or know someone who uh, uses general neutral pronouns or, pro or pronouns different from the assigned at birth, open to LGBTQIA uh, plus, uh, and more likely to live at home in their 20s, living with romantic partners before marriage, wait until 30 to get married, have kids, or buy a house, not necessarily in that order. So uh, again, uh, the, the statistics are showing that's what's going on. Um, and then this, this uh, thing here is interesting too, because uh, Generation Z spirituality um, talks about just Christian is this 22%, uh, Protestant is 16%, and then Catholic is 16%. So, uh, lots of spirituality here that's showing up uh, on this chart, and this comes from the springtime research. But uh, then when you look at this here, they're spiritual, but they're not coming to church uh, because uh, the first one, uh, attend never, uh, is 27%. They attend, but only enter once a year, 25% and then attend one to three times a year. So you can see there's not a lot of this age group going to church right now. Um, so again, this comment here is interesting. 
uh, to read. You can read that. But uh, then this back page, it's kind of interesting because uh, they did this values gap here uh, and what uh, issues were important to uh, the Generation Z folks. And, uh, you know, you can, you can look at uh, the, uh, what uh, they care about versus the, uh, what uh, they feel other people care about. And you can see the gaps. So they, they care about LGBTQ issues, gender equality, uh, uh, immigration rights, income uh, inequality, disability rights, environmental causes, reproductive rights, racial justice, Black Lives Matter, and gun reform. So you can see, you know, you just go down this whole thing. And, uh, the gap is all kind of in the 20% um, in, in what they believe versus the other generations in society. Um, so, um, so that's interesting too. And then uh, this last graph here, young people who tell us I'm flourishing a lot, uh, very, they got very religious, religious, not religious and uh, disparity. And uh, basically, are they flourishing at work? The religious people say 34% yes, only 14% no. So they're uh, flourishing at home. Again, the religious groups seem to be flourishing much better than the non-religious on all of these. And finances, physical health and wellness, and uh, mental health and uh, social on life, right? So, uh, so anyway, those, those were some interesting um, points that uh, Becky and uh, Inger, Lori and uh, Chelsea presented at the Senate Assembly. Uh, because they did not present this, the six core commitments there. But, but anyway, I, I thought this was good just so you know you're informed on what's going on because it's not easy out there right now. But any other questions? Bill? I think the, um, I'm going to go way back now too, these six points. Uh -huh. uh, be the best neighbors. Would, uh, would probably necessitate, necessitate all of us finding what neighborhood are we in? Because mm -hmm. probably beyond Ken and Alma, I don't know anybody who lives within even a mile of here from this place. So the vast majority of our congregation doesn't live in this neighborhood. Right. They live on Fox Island or Hartdale or you know, like you guys out on the, on the edge there. And, and so yeah. we need to rethink about our neighborhoods and realize our sphere of influence may not be here, but there. Yeah. Yeah. Relational, not geographic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I know um, since we moved to Gig Harbor, and um, I think it's been the most relational neighborhood we've ever lived in. Um, we know it, over half the people in our neighborhood um, just because of the homeowners association. Yeah. And, uh, and actually we walk around and talk to them out uh, in their front yards. So that didn't have, well, it probably didn't happen in Coeur d'Alene and Spokane because we we're always working. <laughs> now, now people are around. Our house faces south. So I had to put our vegetable garden on the south side. Uh -huh. And everybody going up and down the street watched the progress of the garden and the fence and the raised beds and yeah. everything. And people walking by would stop and chat with us. Uh -huh. So last fall, we decided let's just invite the whole neighborhood to come down. We'll have a barbecue, snacks, and they can see you know up close what we've done. We sent out 67 invitations. And Two families showed up. Well, well, three, but one of the three was my son and his wife who live up the street. Uh -huh. So, so everybody, we got a lot of positive feedback. People would email us or call us. We appreciate the the offer. It was the first weekend that the Mariners were in the playoffs or something oh. like that, so they couldn't come. So we're going to try it again, 
But it's sometimes it's hard to break into yeah. uh, relationships with neighborhood. So how did you identify all 67 of them? It's all available on uh, Pierce County website. Oh, okay. Uh, counties indicates who lives. So we didn't know always if the owner of the property was the same as who was living there. So we just sent the invitation set to our neighbors at and the, the address. Okay, yeah. I think my, my friend has found that as soon as you have one of the young neighbors next door come and work in the garden with you, he has a community now. All these families, they get together and they help each other out all the time. Take him to the doctor's appointments even because he's disabled and can't. But the boys are over heading to the garden, so all the parents are involved in it. It's fascinating. Yeah, we gave away a lot of food out of the garden to the neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, very good example. I, uh, I know we, we have the luxury of knowing our neighbors because of the Homeowners Association. We have all their phone numbers and emails and everything. But uh, outside of that, which again, there are other neighbors, some of them are very friendly because it's like, no trespass, don't step on my lawn or road or whatever. Um, and they make a point about it too, if you walk on that road. So, okay. Uh, any other final thoughts? Uh, appreciate all the comments, but uh, again, the takeaway message, this is all our priority. Uh, uh, it's, it's not an easy task, but uh, again, we need to continue to encourage other people who are here that we're gonna grow young. Let's start with what we have and build from there. So thank you. Yeah, I know uh, in this uh, Senate uh, presentation, they, uh, the first question was, uh, did you talk to a teenager this week? No, no, yeah. So, uh, you know, how many people have that opportunity? Yeah. The other thing that I saw in, in your presentation is that it, this doesn't take any special resources. No. Building money, particular people, yeah. It takes a conscious decision to engage in this question and, and to aid them. Yeah, yeah. I still think there may be value in having cool people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank yeah. Somewhat fuller, maybe more than the job. Some of the costs, again, when you're coming in, they have any contributions. There's not a subject that they're doing. Although it's interesting that there's not a small number of teachers. Yeah, I mean, but I don't like some white boys. My professors would be, if not, I'm just going to be a We don't do that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.